Uh, normally what I do is I start with a white chalk drawing and uh, it's very simple schematic drawing that I can then hang ornament on. These collage elements, the flowers, the body parts, the, um, the, the sort of the biological specimens are all pre-cut uh, usually from field guides and uh, gardening catalogs and, uh, and, the and, and sometimes anatomical catalogs and also um, celebrity magazines and, and so on. So I have, a, and then they are then arranged on these cardboard uh, sheets into my flat file, and they're uh, filed away according to genus, species, color, size, etc. What I do uh, initially and throughout the construction of the work is I often work on the floor. So, um, because what I do is I take collage elements and bits, and I sort of place them on the piece. And then I usually stand on ladders to look down to see how it is. Um, when I like the way these collage elements uh, appear from above on the ladder, then I get down and uh, glue them. Before I put on the, uh, the resin, uh, we have to repaint all the negative areas back to whatever the color is uh, that I'm working on. In, in, in the case of most of the show, it's black. So we take these tiny little brushes and we re repaint all the areas, the negative shapes around the material uh, because the glue uh, leaves residue and it's a very messy, dirty, intuitive process. Uh, I change my mind, I, 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 I scrape things off with like a razor blade or uh, in the cases of sometimes when I in, insert or inlay things, I'll actually use power tools and such. So it can get kind of dusty and dirty. So I, I neaten it all up. So uh, there isn't a lot of struggle that appears in the final work, but, uh, but it's there. So uh, then what we do is we put it back on the floor and uh, I mix up a two-part uh, epoxy resin and then pour it onto the surface of the piece and squeegee it out and then use a blowtorch and, uh, and, and sort of heat up the, the resin. When the piece has been sort of gelled uh, in, in sort of, sort of pre-encapsulated in the resin. Then I, uh, we then sand the surface, uh, get it back on the wall, and that's when it actually becomes uh, really fun for me because then I actually get to be a painter. And then I just mix up paint and then just work on, you know, on the wall, uh, painting different things and working and going back away from the work. You know, I'll, I'll, I'll leave the camera for a second. And then you go, I can just go back and forth, and I'm not on my hands and knees anymore, which is physically much more enjoyable. And, uh, and then, um, then I'll, uh, when I feel that it's done, then I, um, then I get it back on the floor and go through the processes of, of encapsulating that in more resin. The, the resin layers can average between, say, four and 12, depending on what how much I change my mind and what needs to be encapsulated. The, the reason I, I started um, you know, putting, for instance, aspirin in my work and then all the rest of it was um, I started thinking about painting as a window to another reality, that ideal, and I started thinking about how that ideal dovetailed quite interestingly with the rhetoric of psychedelia, um, a rhetoric that had actually touched my own life. And I started seeing a lot of interesting parallels between um, this notion of transcendence and the sublime and, and some of the aspirations around pre-modernist art. So I thought that I would try to sort of like enfold those two things, this sort of thing that came out of art history, the burden of art history that I had inherited, and then the sort of sociology or the social that bracketed my particular world and, and bracketed probably a lot of other people's worlds. So I just tried to, to unfold these two things into these, into these works, uh, one coming out of something I learned and one coming out of something that I lived through. People have, t have talked about the use of psychoactive material in my work, and um, as I've said before, I, I tend to encase it in these tamper-proof resin containers. And I like to put little jokes in my work, and, and I guess the, maybe the central joke is how I rearrange the use value of the objects. Um, 
they have all this power, but they're suspended in this potentiality where they are incapable of entering into the bloodstream to affect consciousness. They can only travel through the eyeballs to affect consciousness. So it's a different way of altering perception. It alters perception the way art, art alters perception, through the eyes. I guess like uh, growing up in the 70s, um, prior to say going into my punk rock immersion, I was, I was exposed to a lot of the, the, the fallout and you know, sort of bad, of bad head shop art um, that seemed sort of cool to me as a kid growing up. But you know, it was a kind of a vulgar pop, I guess a, a sort of vulgar popified version of uh, probably a lot of Asian art. And, and so what that sort of vulgar head shop sort of uh, you know, black light poster art and album cover art uh, maybe was for me was sort of a gateway drug, so to speak, uh, to to the things that inspired it, and and that happened to be Asian art, um, specifically, say Mughal miniatures, uh, Persian miniatures, Tibetan tankas, and that sort of thing, and uh, you know I, I've had a lifelong love of that particular art in in um, you know concurrently with my love of of modernism. And, and so, you know, they often get to play, there's often an, uh, an, an exchange in my work between these different pictorial traditions. In this piece, for instance, called uh, Metal Destroyer, I sort of conflated that sort of rock and roll, heavy metal, the, the sort of epitome of the self-destructive, wild rock guy with this um, sort of many-armed sort of Shiva or Devi, the destroyer that comes out of Hindu, uh, pictorial traditions, and then maybe Vulcan, you know, the god of fire in the underworld that, that comes out of, um, you know, kind of Greco-Roman history. So I was sort of conflating these sort of, sort of three sort of wild, de destructive, self-destructive, uh, on fire sort of entities, uh, both from mythology. And I guess if you look at rock, it's another form of mythology. And so, um, and, and as, when you look into Tibetan art, you see a lot of these sort of angry deities, um, often with um, sort of um, gaping maws that are kind of consuming and destroying the earth. They usually signify your fear over death or something like that, or, or something that, that a, an initiate may want to conquer, a sort of, uh, um, but in, and so I just sort of conflated all those things into this piece called, called Metal Destroyer. Well, uh, I guess I'm going to talk about this piece called uh, Expecting to Fly, which is um, uh, a line from a, a Neil Young song. Um, and uh, who's, you know, I would say, you know, one of my favorite p persons in rock. But um, it, yeah, this is a guy, you know, stage diving, you know, into a mosh pit, I guess. Um, and I guess uh, I'm sort of. Um, uh, sort of tapping into my, my sort of punk rock past. You know, that could have been me, you know, maybe in like the 70s or something. Um, I, I, I've never really uh, understood um, a lot of the friction between sort of like uh, punk ideology and, and 60s ideology. They all seem to be getting, they all seem to be essentially um, about getting outside of yourself you know, maybe it was maybe the '60s was more about transcendence, and maybe punk rock was more about oblivion. But um, but there was always this uh, notion of getting outside of yourself or le leaving like normal reality and losing yourself in the music or the masses or or the drugs or something. And um, so I just sort of like how this guy sort of suspended, you know, between you know heaven and earth. Um, and this crowd may may capture him. I mean, he might be falling out of a building. I try to I try to keep the work ambivalent. You know, I, I think about a lot of things when I'm making my work, but I don't feel um, autocratic about like that. The viewer has to know that this is what I meant in order to enjoy the work. I mean, people, different people are going to bring different their own personal experiences to the work and possibly come up with entirely different reasons for liking or hating the work. In, in doppelganger effect, um, it's, it's a basically a symmetrical binary abstraction of um, prim composed primarily of six radiating arcs that are set at different points. Uh, 
I had to make these, these arcs using 20-foot uh, diameter compasses that I scribed uh, on the floor on my, using the entire width of my studio in order to make them. Um, it was actually kind of harder to make than it probably looks because uh, it involved making you know, giant tools. I've always freely worked between abstraction and representational work um, since the very beginning. Um, I guess because I've never really seen, they, they always seem to be about the same thing to me. Um, there's always this, you know, like the best of both kinds of work can take you outside of yourself momentarily and you can get lost in, in, in it. It's, it's worked for me with great abstract work and with great representational work. So I've never posited one over the other. It's just another, um, it's another example, I guess, of like how I, um, how I allow, um, say, oppositional ideologies to play in my work.